For as long as I can remember, people have been asking me to cover Topps' Dinosaurs Attack series on the channel, and I've hesitated to do this for a couple of different reasons. One, I was a bit off-put by the fact that it was a trading card set, which would have been some new ground for me to cover here on the channel. And two, I mean, just look at some of these cards. They are so extremely violent and gory. I just didn't think I would be able to swing that with YouTube's strict policies. However, after I got a few comments in my last video, the one where I covered a few dinosaur horror stories, the topic of dinosaurs attack came up again and I decided to do some research on it. Turns out there's a story that's created out of the card set that was further expanded with a five issue comic series that would be fully released in 2013. But there's actually an interesting story with dinosaurs attack. Interesting enough for me to move some things around to cover it for this week's video. And considering how I've gotten away with showing and talking about some weird things on the channel, I think I can get away with showing at least some of the ones that aren't horrifically graphic. As I mentioned, Dinosaurs Attack is a series of stickers and trading cards that were released by Topps in 1988. Both the stickers and the cards were known for their over-the-top violence and satirical depictions of dinosaurs, with all of the cards having this pulp science fiction-esque cover to pay homage to 1950s sci-fi films that were also known to have these colorfully exaggerated and exciting covers. On top of that, these cards were also based on a previous card series that Topps had made in 1962 called Mars Attacks, which held the same infamy that Dinosaur's Attack would have many years later, for also having very violent and graphic imagery of aliens invading Earth and killing innocent people, which, believe it or not, was apparently marketed towards kids, making it very controversial for the time period. At this point in time, during the 60s, dinosaurs were sort sort of put in the back burner for sci-fi media, as aliens had overtaken them in popularity as much as they were overtaking Earth. This would last for a couple of decades as the dinosaur craze wouldn't come back till around the late 70s, and they would build their way back up throughout the 80s and of course the 90s. With that in mind, Art Spiegelman, Len Brown, and Gary Gerani would look to create something original, but also something to jump on this dinosaur trend that was going around at the time. That, coupled with the success of darker, satirical, and fantastical stories both in film and other card sets, were all signs that creating something like this that, but with dinosaurs, was a guaranteed success. And so, the project was greenlit by Tops, and Dinosaur's Attack was born through stickers and cards that were just as violent and satirical as its extraterrestrial predecessor from the early 60s. According to some 25th anniversary material, Gerani's goal in 1988 was to get dinosaurs out of the textbooks and put them back in the city streets where they belonged. The Dinosaur's Attack cards represented the first important attempt to revive that 1950s sci-fi subgenre, the prehistoric beast versus modern man scenario. However, the cards weren't just all blood and guts, there was actually a story within the series that ran for a total of 55 cards. And apparently, the story seemed good enough to greenlight a comic adaptation for it as well, which would prove to be short-lived during this point in time as the cards didn't sell as well as they were hoping. However, years after the initial series, things would eventually look up for Dinosaur's Attack again. So as I just mentioned, the cards are notorious for their very violent depictions of prehistoric life against the human race which I would assume was primarily the result of parents who didn't want their children to be exposed to over-the-top and desensitizing imagery like these. However, the cards, if put in chronological order, would actually tell a story that was about a scientist who invented a machine called the Time Scanner, which would allow them to send down a particle beam that would harmlessly encompass the entirety of Earth, and allow them to scan any point in time in Earth's history, giving them the opportunity to see things no man has ever seen before, the dinosaurs. But due to some mishaps, the dinosaurs begin materializing around the world, destroying buildings and massacring innocents all around. 
It's up to the inventor of the time scanner to undo everything and save humanity, but in doing so, he meets an unlikely and terrifying foe that's simply known as the Supreme Monstrosity. The writings on the card would typically be in the format of newspaper clippings with the title of the card as the title of the paper, to further immerse its audience into the story, but more unique formats were also added to further convey the events that would take place in the art, which are both clever and hilarious. Like, for example, you have the ninth card of the series that shows a Triceratops quite literally crashing a wedding, with the back being an invitation to the reception. On the eleventh card, it shows people trapped inside a basement where a couple of predatory dinosaurs invade, with the writing on the back being a crudely made sign by the survivors that says, Help us, we're trapped in the basement, air running low, monsters burrow out of the ground every night to eat us. On the 13th card, the scene that plays out are plant-eating dinosaurs eating the hairs of a couple of rock stars on stage at a concert, with the back being an image of an in-person interview with the three rock stars that recount the events that had happened that night, with the reporter concluding the herbivorous dinosaurs mistook the rock stars' hair for the tops of trees they're used to eating from. This reporter, who's unnamed in the card series, is actually a recurring character that comes back with more eyewitness reports from those that managed to survive dinosaur attacks and presents it in the same interview format. And speaking of the characters, Jirani has confirmed that some of these characters featured in the cards are actually based on people that he knows and or worked with in the industry, which is actually pretty cool. Other recurring formats include the Prometheus logs. The Prometheus is the name of the ship that the time scanner is stationed in, and the logs are made by the inventor himself who goes by Elias Thorne. In the 20 the 8th card, you can see Thorn encountering some kind of humanoid dinosaur, which he explains from his Prometheus log came to him in a dream after the time scanner fail. This creature is referred to as the Saurian, and it warns Thorn about a greater unseen threat, a literal dinosaur deity of some kind, one akin to that of the devil, which the Saurian calls the Supreme Monstrosity, and how he wants his children to stay in the present to take over the modern day Earth. Then the cards continue in their more one-off style, with another funny card being the 36th one, featuring a dinosaur crashing a comic book convention with the back of the card being a comic panel of the events playing out. In the 45th card, it shows a newsroom being invaded by a stray dinosaur, and the back of the card showing a blank TV screen simply saying, please stand by. Overall, it's clear that given the style and presentation of the cards, this was a series that didn't take itself too too seriously and was just trying to have a little fun, while also creating a small story around it which concludes with Thorne confronting the supreme monstrosity itself and having his wife Helen destroy the time scanner to save the entire human race. An interesting story despite the main focus of these cards being towards the shock value, but clearly it was enough for the creators to want to expand on it a bit. You know, give the plot a bit more weight, give the characters some emotional conflict, and make the whole thing bigger and better. So they made a comic miniseries out of it, or at least that was the plan. In 1991, Gary Gerani would get together with several artists, including Herb Trimpey, Earl Norem, and George Freeman, to create a three-part comic series based on the Dinosaur's Attack trading cards that would be published by Eclipse Comics. Originally, there were going to be three issues published, but only one was ever released during this point in time due to the poor sales of the cards. Within this original issue were four new cards that came exclusively with the comic, including Three Men Lose a Baby, Seasons Bleedings, The Unfriendly Skies, and Whom Gods Destroy. And it seems like there was going to be some kind of continuation with the card series at least that was somewhat teased in one of these exclusive cards. On the back of the Whom Gods Destroy cards, it reads that the second Dinosaur's Attack storyline was beginning, and that the Supreme Monstrosity was returning with a vengeance as many important scientists and this this random young motorcyclist would completely vanish as a part of the monstrosity's plan to reopen the time stream and release his children onto present day Earth once again. So the human race is now in the hands of Alice Thorne, Elias Thorne's daughter who is now an adult in this second storyline. 
Unfortunately, at this point in time, it seemed that people weren't very hyped for any of this despite what it was offering. Because all of it would eventually be cancelled, and with it, any possible future plans for the continuation of the series. But over the span of 25 years, Dinosaur's Attack would become a sort of cult favorite and would eventually develop a following of fans that wanted to see the project fully finished. So for the 25th anniversary of Dinosaur's Attack in 2013, the creators of the original comic would return to finish the story within a total of five issues that were published by IDW. These five issues would finally complete the story that was, as expected, pretty much the same as the trading cards. But the creators delivered on making it more in-depth and giving more weight to the plot and characters while still having that funny and satirical tone reminiscent to the original card series. Jirani would go into more detail about this comic's comeuppance in the end segment of the third issue of the comic, where he says his art for the initial unfinished Dinosaur's Attack comic back in 1991 was noticed by IDW's president Greg Goldstein, who wanted to see the project fully realized and concluded, so he gave Jirani and his team the opportunity to finish it up. There would be a mass reconstruction effort which would prove to be a challenging experience for Jirani, but in the end, after 25 long years of waiting, the story for the original Dinosaur's Attack comic would have its conclusion. The story follows Elias Thorne as he's preparing to test out his time scanner invention on Earth for the first time, which is considered to be an important moment in history as it could lead to the birth of a new scientific age. Of course, not everyone is on board with the idea, like his ex-wife Helen, and are actually protesting the time scanner demonstration due to the more ethical issues it produces, like the fact that it could potentially invade the privacy of all of Earth's current inhabitants as much as it does for everything else in the past. Not to mention the bigger problem with the idea of a particle beam washing over the entirety of Earth, even if it is deemed unharmful. Helen is actually on a ship heading to the Prometheus to protest the demonstration in person. During his presentation on the time scanner leading up to the demonstration, Helen interrupts to state her case on why she and others disagree with his invention, and this is enough for the delegates to delay the test to look further into the feasibility of the machine. Elias is angry at Helen for disrupting this very important moment in his career, thinking she did it deliberately, but Helen claims she's doing it for their daughter Alice, who is on Earth right now dealing with the flu. With this, their argument eventually subsides, and they they start talking while they wait for the outcome of the delay. Thorne admits that he had been conducting ESP experiments on himself, as he's been known to have high esper levels, and through these experiments, he found out that he's able to generate small levels of telekinetic powers enough to carry smaller objects. At least, that's what he thought, but when he finished the test, the object was still floating, and soon, a sinister presence made itself known to Thorne that he has been sensing frequently ever since. What this entity is remains a mystery, but Thorne is someone who's been known to have a troubled mind by those who are close to him. This is further elaborated by Ambrose, Elias' caretaker who is also on the Prometheus to witness the testing of his newest invention. He's doing an interview with Gowen, a reporter who's based on the unnamed reporter from the original card series, where he tells him about Thorne's troubled childhood, how he was a child prodigy and was educated privately meaning he was lonely and deprived of very many emotional outlets. The only one he seemed to have was from his older brother who passed away when Thorne was 12, which also cemented the idea to Thorne that there was no god. As he got older, he would become a workaholic to perform real-life miracles through his inventions and milestones in science. His accomplishments gave him a big head, which was one of the reasons why his marriage with Helen wouldn't work out. Back at the lab, some unseen force ends up triggering the system and initiates the time scanner test, which is set to go off soon, so Thorne is quickly alerted about the abrupt test, and they're unable to stop it, leading him to decide they should just go along with their original plans for the demonstration if they're unable to do anything anyways. So they do, and the particle beam scans the entirety of Earth, which then projects a moment in time millions of years ago on the screen for everyone to see. 
This is soon interrupted by the same unknown entity that had been taunting Thorn, and something goes horribly wrong with the scan. This interference from the mysterious entity results in dinosaurs materializing all around the world, who immediately wreak havoc, cause destruction, and of course, brutally kill and devour many innocent civilians. In some cases, the dinosaurs spawn into the world fighting each other, causing a lot of collateral damage, and in another, more disturbing case, a dinosaur even materializes in the same space as a person, resulting in this absolutely horrific scene here that feels very reminiscent of old body horror movies. Luckily, this dude is put out of his misery. The US Army is enlisted to take care of the problem, where the general actually makes an interesting discovery about the dinosaurs. Apparently, some of the dinosaurs have grouped together after materializing and have been strategizing attacks. They do this by sending out a scout, surround the populated area city by city, and then attack their human enemies, which is something that is most likely happening to them at that moment. So they prepare for an attack, and as the general suspected, a Struthiomimus scout is sent out and is blown up out of nowhere. But before they can respond to this, a massive army of dinosaurs make their way towards the soldiers. What's really cool about this panel specifically is that all of these creatures here are callbacks to early dinosaur cinema. You can see hints of retro-style Godzilla monsters, various animal references from old Slurposaur films. I could be wrong, but that might be Retosaurus and Paleosaurus from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and The Giant Behemoth respectively, along with Reptilicus and Gorgo, I think. Holy shit, even Gertie makes an appearance here. That's so cool. Too bad a lot of them end up being murdered by airstrikes. Listen guys, when people said that the old days of dinosaur cinema was dead, this is not what they had in mind. Regardless of modern weaponry, the dinosaurs work together to fight back against the army, and as expected, what results is an absolute bloodbath. Along with this, there are also a few times where Elias and Helen's kids are shown dealing with the events of the invading dinosaurs. During one of these nights, Alice, her baby brother, and one of her friends try to reach out for their neighbor's help after their caretaker steps out but doesn't return. One of the neighbor boys appears and fills them in on the current issue of dinosaurs invading the world before being attacked by one of them and is taken away into the night. The girls retreat back inside but are rescued by a soldier with a rocket launcher who escorts them to a shelter. Unfortunately for the soldier, he's taken away by a pterosaur and drops his weapon. A theropod dinosaur also shows up and attacks the children, but they grab the nearby rocket launcher and use it on the dinosaur, killing it instantly and literally high-fiving each other for a job well done, which is a reference to one of the cards from the original series. This whole panel here just makes me realize how weird these images would be if they're all out of context. I mean, they're already weird in context, so I mean, I can only imagine they're weird or out of context. Back at the Prometheus, Helen is given access to the lab, as she knows Thorne's technique better than anyone. They work for hours before Thorne eventually falls asleep and has a very strange dream. In it, he's confronted by the Saurian, the humanoid dinosaur that appeared in the original card set, who tells Thorne the difference between humans and dinosaurs is that humans have souls and are able to discern between right and wrong, whereas dinosaurs are savages that aren't capable of moral choice. It's also revealed here that Thorne had somehow used his ESP abilities to tap into the Mesozoic era all those weeks ago which is what seemed to have summoned the strange entity, the supreme monstrosity that has been haunting him ever since. The Saurian also confirms that it was, in fact, the supreme monstrosity that had interfered with the time scan and had caused all of this mess, as it's all part of its plan to unleash its children onto the modern world to claim it back as its own. When he awakes from the dream, Thorne discovers a new method to use to fix the time scan issue, to which he introduces to his team. The equations that he holds make it so that if they initiate the time scan again, they can reverse the process that caused the dinosaurs to appear in the first place. Helen is pulled aside by Ambrose who tells her about his concerns with Thorn, how his telekinetic powers could have been strong enough to pull the lever that caused all of this. He inadvertently suggests that Thorn may have planned all of this all along. Helen leaves with this information, but Ambrose soon realizes that there is something more sinister out there after he's confronted by the dinosaur devil himself, which ends up killing him and the rest of the crew as well, everyone except for Elias and Helen. 
At first, she suspects it was him behind all of this, to which he seems to almost agree with. In the end, she's unable to pull the trigger and the two continue to work through the problem. Finally, they get the time scanner ready for the new equations and prepare for the second initiation, when all of a sudden, Elias is pulled into the screen by the supreme monstrosity. Despite the situation, Elias looks almost happy, as the confirmation of a deity like this one may confirm the existence of God after all, which seems to be enough for him. He's accepted his fate and tells Helen to trigger the scanner. She does and gets the hell out of there as doing so starts breaking the Prometheus apart. As Elias is dying, he sees his brother in the afterlife before the scanner completely blows up. As that's happening, the dinosaurs are quite literally ripped out of the modern age and are sent back to their own time, and Helen is able to escape the Prometheus and crash lands back to a dinosaur-free Earth. Where the story ends with her revealing how funny it was that the whole point of the time scanner was to see what had wiped the dinosaurs out all those millions of years ago. She realizes it was them who wiped them out. It's amazing to see that after all of those years of waiting, people finally got to see the comic come to a conclusion. But surprisingly, that wouldn't be the end for Dinosaur's Attack. Because a couple of years later, Topps had launched a Kickstarter for a project called Mars Attacks Occupation, where they were looking to re-release older Mars Attacks cards along with creating several new ones in multiple different series. One of these series was a Dinosaur's Attack and Mars Attacks crossover that actually loosely continued the storyline from the original Dinosaur's Attack cards. The story takes place 30 years after the events of the original Time Scanner incident, where apparently the project had been shelved due to the government pulling funding away from them. After all of these years, Martians would then invade Earth, and in a desperate attempt to fight against the aliens, Thorn's son Jacob, I'm assuming the infant brother of Alice from the comics, would break into his old lab and initiate the Time Scanner to open a portal from the past and have the dinosaurs fight off the aliens. You probably noticed that this sounds somewhat familiar to the second storyline that was teased in that one exclusive card from the initial run of the Dinosaurs Attack comic, where the story was going to continue with Alice as an adult before being shelved. In a way, that story seems to have been repurposed in this loose continuation slash crossover, but reimagined to better fit the events that play out. In the end though, the story would become much bigger than any of the characters that had been introduced, as the main focus of this card set would be towards the battle between the dinosaurs and the aliens. Bringing the dinosaurs back worked at first, with Jacob opening more portals in select locations to strategically attack the aliens, but as the war raged on, humans began to pay dearly for their choice in using dinosaurs to fight their battles. The fight between the two species resulted in a lot of collateral damage against the humans, and soon the aliens would begin to capture and run experiments on them to turn them into giant mutants to fight against the dinosaurs. These monster men are given incredible strength and healing abilities, becoming formidable opponents to the seemingly never-ending onslaught of dinosaurs. The war continues and civilization becomes non-existent, with the few human survivors left being forced to revert back to their less advanced days and become barbarians in this new world. The world was now infested with prehistoric life, nowhere was safe, not the skies nor the seas and things would only get worse for the human race. With the series ending with the aliens finding a way to mind control the dinosaurs and use their new slaves to take over the world. But the series doesn't end there, because around 2020, a sequel to Dinosaurs Attack vs. Mars Attacks would be created, called Mars and Dinosaurs Attack History. But at this point, the series seemed to have become slightly obscure, because while you can find any of these other cards all around the internet, these ones were a bit more rare. In this series, I think it's implied the aliens got their hands on the time scanner because the cards now follow the aliens in various points in human history, battling against people from the given time period with their dinosaur slaves. There's a card depicting the aliens invading a pirate ship, one of an alien on a raptor chasing after a cowboy on a horse. The last card features an alien riding a tyrannosaur to battle a Scottish Highlander, and so on. 
As you can tell, the series started to become less and less story-based. Not that it was heavily story-based at all, but it still used to have some linear story elements to it, but this newest series was more focused on the exciting adventures of the time-traveling aliens. Which sounds like a fun concept, but it seems that this is where it would end for the crossover. Now, I don't know too much about this final card, as I can't find it anywhere else on the internet besides this site called Prehistoric Life Collectible. Digest. The card features one of the aliens on the back of what's presumably a raptor facing the supreme monstrosity. It's a shame I can't find a higher quality version of this image because holy shit, it looks very cool. And apparently the name on the card is Mars and Dinosaurs in Hell, Fiery Doom. Considering what the text on the back of the card says, this was most likely an exclusive card made for the Mars and Dinosaurs Attack History series. And the reason why I say this is because on the back of the card, it states the aliens traveled too far back in time to where there was no universe at all, only hell where they meet the supreme monstrosity. The monstrosity says, you shall be punished for your hubris. Tampering with time has consequences. And according to the final sentence of the card, the alien attack on history had come to a fiery end. And as far as I'm concerned, this was the final card in the series, and the lack of images of it around the internet is probably a testament to how rare the card probably was. Sifting around the Kickstarter page for Mars Attacks Occupation, there was several mentions of both Dinosaurs Attack vs. Mars Attacks and its sequel Mars and Dinosaurs Attack History. But I never saw a mention of this card Mars and Dinosaurs in Hell. So if you have this card or any of the other cards from these two series and you're watching Watching this video, do everyone a favor and upload some high quality images of these cards because that would be nice to see. But as far as the card series goes for Dinosaur's Attack, it seems that it had finally come to an end. Hello, unscripted update here. So as I was editing this video, I was getting like super annoyed that I couldn't find any high quality images of these cards. So I did one final stretch of research to see if I could find them anywhere. And as it turns out, I found out some more information in regards to Mars and dinosaurs attack history. So while I initially found out about this card set that Topps did back in 2015 for their Kickstarter for Mars Attacks Occupation, I just found out that Topps actually did a another Kickstarter in February of 2020 called Mars Attacks Uprising. And that's actually the Kickstarter that Mars and Dinosaurs Attack History was a part of. And skimming through all of their updates, I ended up finding a bunch of different cards, but one of the ones I ended up finding was the Dinosaur Satan one. So yeah, we now have a high quality image of this card that I could literally not find anywhere else on the internet, so that's fucking awesome. So with this card set, they decided to sell some merch alongside with it too, one of them being being an exclusive binder with some Mars and Dinosaurs Attack History print on it. And with this binder, you also get an exclusive card, which was the Mars and Dinosaurs in Hell one. So yeah, that explains that. There you go. Um, update over. Dinosaur's attack may not have been an instant hit, but like I mentioned earlier, it had a cult following and sometimes that's all you need. Believe it or not, there were not one, but two attempts to adapt this card series into a movie that was going to be made by Warner Brothers. The first time around, Gremlins director Joe Dante was set to create the movie with producer Mike Finnell and claymation animator Will Vinton. According to an archived article written for the Rapper magazine, Jirani had said on an over-the-phone interview, Dinosaur's Attack has an interesting history because when I first did it in the late 80s, I brought it up to Warner Brothers and Joe Dante and they had optioned it. They were going to do a movie at that point before Jurassic Park was even written. I was the first one to bring back attacking dinosaurs, chasing people and all that, which was like a 1950s type of thing. Warner was going to do it, Dante was going to direct it. He was very, very excited about it. And then the galleys for Jurassic Park started going around the studios and everyone started saying, well, it's Michael Crichton, Spielberg jumped on it, then everyone else was afraid to do a dinosaur movie. And so when Joe Dante didn't work out with the movie, the rights were then handed off to Tim Burton, who had also secured the rights for Mars Attacks as well. 
However, he had similar sentiments when it came to his concerns of a dinosaur attack movie and thought that it would be too similar to Jurassic Park and would suffer for it. So he opted to make the Mars Attacks movie instead. Despite this worry over the comparisons between the two films, Jurassic Park would spawn two more sequels indicating that there was a massive demand for dinosaurs on the big screen. Hell, in the first sequel, The Lost World Jurassic Park, it literally features a tyrannosaur roaming around San Diego in the final sequence. This is what Jurani had to say about the movie after he watched it. I know, that was very dinosaur attack-esque. They even had the bit with the little dog in the doghouse. It had those little touches, but Dinosaur's Attack was more fanciful. It was like a homage to the wild movies of the 50s which had no self-consciousness. It was more inspired by the posters where the dinosaurs would tower over cities and be impossibly large. And of course our storyline with Elias Thorne and the Time Titler and all that kind of stuff was much more sci-fi-ish. That's the kind of juicy melodrama that movies I grew up with were all about. Dinosaur's Attack was meant to be half melodrama with touches of parody and humor. The satire was built into it. At the same time, I hoped that the melodrama of the central story and the fun of that melodrama would carry it through. I still think it could be made into a movie. And according to a segment of the third issue of the comic adaptation, Jurani also briefly mentions the possibility of a TV show for Dinosaur's Attack. There were discussions of a live action format of the show, or maybe a Saturday morning cartoon animation format of the show. But in the end, according to all of these sources, Jurassic Park would scare people away from pursuing these ideas and they were instead shelved. But you know, even though Dinosaur's Attack didn't get to reach Hollywood levels of fame and glory, the legacy of it is still very much present to this day. The cards, the stickers, the comics continue to live on as both memories and collector's items, representing the collaboration between artists that came together to create such a colorful, unique, and violent world of prehistoric life. 